Hello and welcome to the Money Marketing Podcast. I'm Kimberly Dondo, Digital Content Manager, and we are back again for our end of month podcast. I'm joined again by the editorial team. So I will let everyone introduce themselves. Hello, I'm Katie Pigden, editor of Money Marketing. Hi, I'm Lois Valley, Chief Reporter. I'm Michael, News Editor. I'm Darius, Investments Reporter. Okay, great. Thank you guys for coming back. We're slightly light on the team, um, but you know how August does what August does. People are all over the place, um, but I'm glad you are all here with me. Um, so I guess we'll get started by talking about some of the stories that you covered in August. So Darius, I noticed you had quite a few in our um, top 10 stories. So are there any particular stories that stood out for you? Um, well, the one that uh, came top was regarding um, consumer duty and um, <clears throat> um, if it should curb or end active management. And that was one that got a lot of attention and a, a lot of comments. Um, and it was a uh, <clears throat> a re- a re- no, I mean, it originally came from a, a, a tweet and, uh, yeah, a good article for him, but um, uh, um, a, a lot of people sort of uh, heavily disagreed or agreed with it. But, yeah, um, uh, basically the, the, the sort of argument was that consumer duty should put an end to advisors putting their clients in active funds um, okay. because it sets up a high and clear standard of consumer protection across financial services. Um, and uh, and then some advisors did say, you know, they in, in general they see uh, the old passive reactive debate. You know, passive sort of usually comes top and usually wins, and it makes more sense and it's, uh, it's cheaper and so forth. Um, but um, you know, everyone agreed. Um, uh, Dra- Dan Brocklebank for um, uh, investments, a UK direct, uh, sorry, a UK director from Orbis Investments. He 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 did disagree with it, and he said every. Um, Type of um, a passive manager as a form of active anyway, and and you know mm-hmm. there's there's more to the story. So yeah, it's not just a simple uh, yes or no sort of thing. Uh, but yeah, that, that did get a lot of attention. Did uh, cause a bit of a debate. Um, so yeah, that was uh, that was my my number one. Uh, well, yeah, it was no, it was number one of a list. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Um, so isn't? But I thought like the whole point of a diversified portfolio was to have a balance of all of that passive active or am i dumb i don't know <laughs> I, th- I think it's a, a, a debate that's been rolling on uh for years really like whether active management should exist or or everyone should just put their stuff in passive and just sort of get on with their their life really um mm-hmm. but obviously i suppose depending on what side you sit on there's going to be an argument as to whether that does well or not i guess how often you know these people can actually beat the rest of the market and consistently mm. beat the rest of the market is what some people have been saying but obviously there are these um products in- available that you can just put it in and it's it's let it get on um mm-hmm. but i i think it's going to be one of those things that we're, we're probably still talking about down the line as well i don't i don't think the consumer duty probably will fully end active management i'm sure um people in that sort of field uh, you know are, are good at what they're doing and mm. they can then take more of a focused approach on particular funds and and, and things like that but mm-hmm. yeah it's just just interesting how much attention it attracted from our readers i thought it would do well but um yeah. maybe not not as well as it did actually i guess some people are very passionate about it um but uh what about you, Katie? Uh, you, I saw you dipping your toes a lot more uh, this month when it came to writing. Yeah, I've been back into sort of um, doing some news. Um, so I had a little chat with the Quilter CEO um, as sort of platform results and things were coming out. Uh, they mentioned that they are looking at a different sort of strand of advice as well. So they've got their network and their national, and then they're thinking of doing sort of something that fits in between that. So that sort of came out from that discussion as well. Um, so it's interesting to see what people think about that. Um, but one thing I also done was that um, Quilter was edged ahead. And I literally put edged ahead because with platform assets um, now coming in at 69.4, billion for them just slightly ahead of Aberdeen at 69.3 billion and I'm sure Aberdeen will have a lot to sort of 
say about that and try and make sure they get back in what would be deemed pole position, I guess. Um, Mm -hmm. But overall, the picture for the retail platform market has looked quite bleak in recent months, actually. Um, Stats have been showing a record low for net sales in the second quarter of 2023, um, coming in at 2.8 billion, I think, net sales. Um, The lowest on record that's encoded to some people who uh, report on all of that, down 38% on the first quarter as well. So it's just really showing the sort of challenging market that there is at the moment. Maybe Mm -hmm. people aren't putting as much money away or they're actually needing to withdraw some of that money to to fund various things, just the cost of living. Um, So, yeah, we we also had um, Aegon net outflows of 1.1 billion in the first half of the year. I had to double check I was reading the figures correctly as it had been a while and it was quite early in the morning um <laughs> so I was looking you know brackets definitely mean minus right and you yeah. know and, and things like that because that would be a, a terrible figure to have got the wrong way round. um <laughs> so I think you know it's just a, a a challenging time platforms are sort of noticing that um more than some other areas really where just sort of it's hard to hold on to that money. Um, yeah, so a lot of them are still sort of saying, well, we're still investing actually in the platform and the technology and stuff behind it. And there's still things coming down the line. And although no one has a crystal ball, uh, you know, they do think it will pick up again and we will sort of steady it, I guess, eventually. But it, yeah, it's just been sort of um, each time you sort of see these numbers, it's quite, quite stark. Yeah. I think whenever I have conversations with people, they always say, especially if they've been in the industry for like 20, 30 years, they're less likely to be um, perplexed or shocked at any downturns because they always say, oh, no, this this happens a lot. We just think that while we're in the moment, this is terrible and it's going to have it's going to last forever, but it doesn't last for as long as it seems. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I think sometimes, um, obviously, there's been so many factors at play here, haven't there? You know, elsewhere Mm -hmm. in the world, things that are going Mm -hmm. on, cost of living. I think it's it's all that thing at once. Um, A lot of advised clients, obviously, probably the advice they usually get from their advisors is, yeah, stay put, don't do anything Mm -hmm. too drastic, you know, don't change the way you're sort of doing things. But whether obviously people can put as much aside when yeah. you know their pay or whatever will only be a certain amount or whatever their future things are or maybe sort of going yeah actually I'm going to take some of that out to start enjoying yeah. life and not sort of feel I'm um, you know that that's that was the whole purpose of, of building it up so maybe you know naturally we've got to a point as well where those people would have been taking out some of their money because that was that was part of the plan all along um yeah. so I would imagine it's quite a few things all at play at once but yeah you're right we'll probably look back at some point I I remember um talking of sort of active versus passive for quite some time my husband had set up a a Vanguard account and hadn't really said anything and I think he was a bit worried I was gonna sort of wonder what was happening to money or if it didn't (laughs) play out um and you know I think it was probably pre me joining money marketing anyway so it was suddenly a discussion like later on down the line of like oh you've had this secret account well how, well, how is it doing you know and let, let's yeah. have a little look because we've had the the rainy day funds and things that we were saving for for specific pots but I think that he viewed this as his thing of oh well this is a little bit more of the ordinary to what I usually do <laughs> yeah. um and you know it was steadily doing quite well but what he was noticing is you know is what a, a lot of advisors would say it was that regular putting money in that was actually sort of bring in the most benefits for him um mm-hmm. and then there was obviously when the pandemic hit you could see where it sort of dropped a little bit then but it's actually for him it's it looks now when you look at the the time scale it looks like a small blip um compared and it's just sort of carried on sort of marching on um mm-hmm. and then I actually set mine up a lot later than his so mine's never felt like it's got to those high percentages that his currently show um compared to mine sort of but you know the the trick is obviously I suppose not to look at it every day yeah (laughs) definitely I do I do tend to look have a little look because I'm just (laughs) curious of how sort of things are performing but I do the same with my bank account even though I know nothing's really changed so um it's just a weird little quirk of mine (laughs) 
Yeah. No, I sometimes I have to like delete apps because I'm just like, no, I'm just giving myself anxiety for no reason and it's not worth it. So uh, I'm not going to jump to conclusions or do anything drastic. So I just have to take myself away from it sometimes. Um, but Mike, what about you? What story stood out for you in uh, August? So uh, a couple of a few, um, all pension. Well, uh, a lot of them pension related, which is unsurprising. Um, pensions guru. Pensions guru. Yeah. But um, I think one of the ones which uh, most interested me and which was or something by, by my esteemed colleagues um, was uh, the, uh, the one about Monzo uh, Bank, Challenger Bank, uh, potentially looking for a uh, a pension sort of uh, product manager, new role mm. to head up their new savings and investment team. Mm. And uh, what was just interesting about that is it's been a bit of a a kind of um, uh, like, like what well, I guess well known theme that you know uh, uh, comes up and cups comes up every now and again about uh, big banks, about how uh-huh. banks used to be in uh, financial advice, and then mm. since like the financial crisis and uh, RDR. Um, they left because they couldn't charge commission anymore. Um, and mm-hmm. so this Monzo thing was, mm-hmm. was kind of quite interesting because it seems that they are actually trying to sort of, you know, you know, come in um, and actually do something, um, you know, with with pensions and, and advice, which is which is kind of quite, quite interesting. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, and a, and a kind of uh, and also a new bank, not not like an old bank, like a like a Lloyd's or a Barclays or one of the, the big boys, so to speak. Um, so that was yeah. quite interesting. Um, uh, and then Hartley Pension. I think, um, sorry. I, sorry. I, I was, I just wanted to jump in. I think quite a lot of those like tech for me, I think because they're all on apps and stuff like that. I have a Monzo account, but I also have a money box account. And I remember maybe in 2020 or something like that, Monzo also not money box launched their own, um, uh, that you could transfer your pension pot all into one place. So I yeah. I imagine that might be the same thing that Monzo is doing so that they can step into that, similar to like Pension B and all those other platforms where you're able to just have everything in one place. Because I think a lot of those tech-based banks um, kind of are competing to be the best in that area, I guess, really or have the most customers. Yeah. That, that's a really great point and um thanks for for, for raising that because i think yeah you've got all these different pensions pots um and they need to be aggregated and if, uh-huh. and, and if um, i don't know what the estimate is about how what missing pots are worth um i think that's quite well overall in the uk it's worth quite a bit of money so mm-hmm. if you can get hold of that um and, you know it's a potential revenue stream yeah. um and i guess that's that's sort of what pension b is doing they're getting hold of all these different um uh assets um mm-hmm. and are moving a bit faster than some of the older legacy businesses which have less good it and data um, yeah so so yeah so that that's kind of um interesting how um that's the de- that's developing um and then uh another kind of pension story i, I did is about uh the hartley pensions saga um that's that's continuing so that was a a sort of um uh, uh sit provider uh sort of wrapper um which uh uh, uh collapsed i guess the degree of uh, um uh, ignominy um and the wind down of that and when the pensioners will be paid is still ongoing and the date when they might be paid when they might get some money just seems to keep um going longer and longer into the future and the their administrators um uh, UHY Hacker and Young came out and said that it's unlikely they're going to be paid. Uh, you know, they're not going to be paid this year. They'll be paid mm. next year. So, so poor pensioners again can't get their money, um, which is a kind of classic, classic story. Um, it's it's stuck. So, if you can help, pe- um, you know, people get their pension money, whether you're a kind of challenger bank or you're an administrator, um, you'll be doing some good work because that seems to be a bit of a theme. Um, you know, it was a bit of a theme in August. Um, and then I think the, the, uh, uh, a couple of other ones I wanted to mention, um, mm-hmm. one was that the government extended its, its, uh, cold call ban. Okay. 
um, from uh, pensions uh, product, like pension products to all financial products. So it's confirmed it's going, going ahead of that. Um, and then the FCA also did a bit of a rollback on um, on it on this thing it was trying to do called uh, I think it was its core advice regime, okay. otherwise known as simplified advice, where they were trying to um, um, increase the access uh, for mainstream like uh, investment advice to some to a very narrow range of, of products like okay. stocks and shares ISAs, um, mm-hmm. and they've rolled back on that, which is which is interesting, I think. Um, and then just looking at it as part of their broader um, advice review. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no was that well things received or? Yes, it was actually, uh, because they the reason actually why they didn't go ahead with it um, was because people told them not to in terms of the, okay. the feedback to their consultation. So so they are, so they are listening. They listen, which yeah. Is, which, is, which is good, because uh, that doesn't always seem to to, to um, happen, or at least that's a complaint from advisors. So it, yeah. it does show then if a consultation is put out, that it is worth people putting their response to it. But and I guess you know, I guess sometimes people think, oh, I won't bother with that, or oh, here's another consultation. But you know, if that's been the thing that the FCA has actually then looked at that advice that's um, that, that's come through, and people have said, well, oh, don't really think this is something you should be focusing on. And it's decided to act upon that, but but that's got to be seen as a positive, I would think. Yeah, definitely. Definitely, and as and thanks for bringing up that point, Casey, because actually I remember when I was writing the article, for some reason I was somewhat surprised. Yeah. That the FC had actually res- responded to and then done something. So even in my own reaction, um, uh, you know, I had actually surprised. Oh, they actually have listened, and I don't know if that that feeling or perception is fair or accurate. But I guess it does go to show that that you know when you have that initial reaction to to something, you know why do you have that feeling? Is there any legitimacy to that to that feeling or perception? So so yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, but exactly respond to FCA consultations. Mm-hmm. Um, and finally, Lois, what did you have that you covered in August that was quirky yeah. and fun? <laughs> Oh, you want quirky and fun first? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, well, I wrote probably the most important article I've ever written for Money Marketing, or at all of, of any brand, I think, Honestly. about whether aliens will need financial advice. Because I noticed, um, excuse my voice, by the way, I've got a horrendous cold, in case you're wondering. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I saw that in the national media, particularly the tabloids, it started picking up like stories about aliens do exist. I didn't actually see that there was anything new that had happened. It seemed they were all just sort of saying, oh, there's new evidence that has come no, out. No, there, but... there was a, I don't know what the US politics is, but they had like uh, in Congress, they had, I think it was in Congress, they had someone who was like on a special ops team being interviewed by different um governors or mm. congress members and asking him questions about things that he had seen and this kind of revealed a lot of details to the public that they were not aware of of like black sites and all this stuff um Ooh. so then people were like oh okay so this is confirming that you know things not of this world have landed here um and then that's where the conversation started. I think at the time, Kim, I hadn't actually seen the initial um, article as well, but my niece was staying with me and she was just like, that's it. I've I've known it all along. I've always said aliens exist and no one's <laughs> listened. And blah, blah. I was like, what are you talking about? And she's like, it's been confirmed in America. And we're saying, you know, to my husband, look, you're a scientist. Have a look. <laughs> there's, there's genuine articles about this and was like very excited by this sort of news what is she talking about like or what site has she read this on you know this is yeah no, be, um, no it's the main is this going to be a genuine um <laughs> thing or not and then yeah happens to sort of read a few articles about it <laughs> i was like oh right okay yeah this isn't a conspiracy anymore so it um so yeah, it did inspired also very, Lois. <laughs> it did very conveniently tie in with the finale of the new star trek series just saying all this news coming out anyway yeah so I thought well I would just um write the weekend essay that week about if aliens do exist and if they haven't already come to earth and if they do come to earth um obviously we don't know what they're like or anything but if they're 
So I had to use Star Trek as my reference point because obviously I don't know what real aliens are like. Mm. Um, so if there's some sort of humanoid ones and they come and move to Earth, they might well need financial advice because they won't necessarily know what our financial system is. Mike, I can see you laughing. <laughs> <laughs> This is very serious. You need to take it seriously. This could happen. I want to just mention, I'm just going to mention Independence Day randomly. I love that movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I do, but like, it's no different than someone moving from another country. You have to learn this financial systems of each country you move to. Um, and it might be frustrating, but you still have to get used to it or acclimate to it. And having an advisor will probably make it a much smoother process. So I completely... There you go. Stand with you. They might not even know what a bank is, so that would be a good starting point. Honestly, <laughs> if I can think of when I first moved to Korea, I first of all didn't speak the language, so that's another barrier. Um, and setting up my bank was a whole different situation there because it was it's a different system that they have, and it might be frustrating for me, but I luckily had someone there who could walk me through the steps. Lois, so. a potential follow up for you. Could this make the advice gap an even bigger problem? You know, yeah, <laughs> suddenly there's possibly. millions of people not getting. Again, I know that sort of also crosses the like active passive debate. This is often a debate as well, depending on who you speak to. Is there an advice gap? Yeah, lots of people will say yes. Lots of people will say no, no, because those people can't afford it and they don't need it anyway, and and, and various things like that. Personally, I am on the side of I think there is an advice gap. And I think obviously advisors who are doing a good job of, you know, advising clients and making sure that they're in a better position, surely people could benefit from that in some way or another. And yes, there's the whole arguments as whether that's all fat advice or, you know, some kind of hybrid thing or something else. But yeah, surely if aliens invade, then uh, we could be in a bigger problem there Lois <laughs> I know they're, they're not going to be able to get an advisor for love nor money anyway because yeah. there's already enough of a human cue they might have yeah. to train as advisors themselves and that might yeah, exactly. solve, that, would that might different. solve the advice gap they they because they, yeah, they, they exactly. won't know how much they should charge for advice anyway so yeah. that might help I don't know I'm just going off on one now <laughs> It's a serious <laughs> financial publication talking about the serious. I love answers. that. <laughs> exactly. I did get. You some never know. Responses. Someone might pick this episode up in, um, like, I don't know, 10, 20 years when aliens are roaming freely. And they'll be like, wow, they were ahead of the curve. Yeah. Thinking about these things. Um, I think that will definitely be the case. Yeah, um, make sure you've got it like to ready to repurpose the content oh, yeah. at the time. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm going to put a notification in my calendar. Um, but also, uh, I did see another weekend essay that you wrote, Lois, um, uh, came out About recently. About how unfit I am. Yes, <laughs> financially and physically. And honestly, who can, I think everyone can relate. Yeah, I was just, so I was saying um, I'd gone to the gym for the first time in more than a year because... I sort of tried to get back into the fitness after lockdown when I just completely, I know some people use lockdown to like get super fit and better themselves. I just used it to watch everything on Netflix and Amazon Prime. I didn't exercise at all. I think I went out for like one walk a day. So I completely lost fitness. Then I sort of started getting back into it again. And then I just stopped again for no apparent reason. Hadn't done it for over a year. Um, went with my sister because she was staying and she wanted to carry on her sort of fitness drive she's been on. Mm -hmm. um, and so she was like, oh, come to the gym with me. So I did. And I, as I put in the weekend essay, I just about managed to limp one kilometer on the running machine at about 8.5 kilometers an hour. And then I was complaining to her going, oh, it's so annoying. You know, I used to be able to do so much faster. I used to just sort of run 15, 16K without even thinking about it. And she said, why don't you stop saying I used to be able to and start saying soon I'll be able to or in the future I'll be able to. And it kind of made me think because I probably get too hung up on um, it, 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 it's going to come do. back around to fact finance. Don't worry, I'm not just talking about yeah. the gym. Um, sort of get hung up on what I used to be able to do or sort of stuck in my current phase and not really be able to get out of it. And if if, um, if you have a very short termist mindset like I do, it's mm -hmm. very hard to sort of think beyond a couple of weeks into the future. So 
all I can do is just sort of think back to what I was like in the past. And the more I think about it, the more it stops me from, because I just think, oh, I used to be so much better. You know, I'm never going to get back there again. So what's the point in even trying? It's just, that's the sort of attitude that I start and it's not very helpful because then obviously I'm not going to better myself in the future. I and know, yeah, does... yeah, I, but I think a lot of people get stuck in that for a period of time and then you kind of realize this isn't going to work and then you pick yourself up and you f- fix whatever it is that is bothering you. Yeah, like with finances. So as um, everyone probably knows, I'm in quite a lot of debt. And um, so I just start thinking, oh, what's another hundred pounds? It doesn't matter because I'm already in thousand pounds worth of thousands of pounds worth of debt but as I put in the weekend essay if you keep doing that over and over again obviously you get more and more and more thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds in debt yeah and then it becomes much harder to come out of because then you're paying off more every month so then it's even harder to save or well I'm not even trying to save right now I'm just trying to get out of debt but even harder mm-hmm. to sort of budget because you're just and then you, I just get into this vicious cycle and it's very yeah. much connected to sort of mental health and mindset because the more I spend the more I get in debt the worse I feel about it therefore the more the more I buy to cheer myself up yeah or the more I don't so much buy stuff it's like the more I go out spend money to cheer myself up so it's all doom and gloom um I did write some news as well by the way yeah <laughs> I'm serious oh, good. Go on, I thought that was news <laughs> um so I went to see, um, you know, Benchmark Capital mm-hmm. um, Network and financial advice firm owned by Schroeders, in the Schroeders group anyway. I went to see them in their Horsham offices. Um, and they, um, so it was Ed Dimot, who I've actually found out is going to be becoming the CEO in January next year, because I got an anonymous tip off and I can't tell you who told me because that would be very bad. But um yeah, found out he's becoming CEO. He's currently managing director of wealth. Anyway, I went to see him and a few others in the business and learned about, well, quite a lot about the business, but I was particularly interested in this. Um, uh, so we were talking about simplified advice or hybrid advice earlier. They're launching a simplified advice or they're piloting at the moment, a simplified advice offering. So for clients, it's basically to onboard clients who don't have necessarily have really um, complicated needs, but they just sort of want to get some advice. So they go through all these, this sort of questionnaire on an app. Um, and it also, it's sort of tied into their sustainability, pre- uh, preferences. So they can put like how sustainable they want the funds that their money is going into to be and stuff like that. Um, and it's quite an interesting one. Although I did notice one of the comments is saying there's no such thing as simplified advice. Advice is just complicated. But I think maybe that's a bit, um, well, I don't know if it's true, because surely you can. Surely there are some instances where someone just needs some simple advice. Yeah. Well, that's where I was sort of think, like, maybe the one-off thing comes into play then, that, you know, you, you might need to sort of try and get yourself in order type of thing. And yes, maybe sort of ongoing advice isn't right for you at that time, but for someone to have a look and sort of, I don't know, point you in the right direction. And maybe that's where the sort of blur of advice and guidance and things comes into it as well. But yeah, I'm yeah, surprised that, there's not more of a thing like that, to be honest. Like a just sort of great. health chat or like an, a finance yeah. MOT or something. Yeah. <laughs> also, even even if they're talking in terms of like it is a complex process, part of the advisor's job is to make that seem easier and simplified to the end customer so whether they want to view it as the thing should be simplified advice but you know is we've said it before about the jargon and and the way sort of the industry can talk sometimes um maybe that you know sometimes people want to keep things overly complex yeah. because then they mm. seem important and you Sounds know we're smarter. Coming to, yeah um and you know m- maybe it does sort of need to look be looked into more in that sort of sense as well of going well yeah maybe actually I think a lot of the problem is there's probably still people that could benefit from advice and maybe would be suitable for advisors to have as clients but they're not aware of financial advisors as a profession anyway you know they've they've heard of an accountant they've heard of various other things but they don't know what a financial advisor or planner is and what they do so they don't know they need it I didn't really know the difference between a financial advisor and an accountant before I joined money marketing to be honest 
Yeah. If it wasn't for this career, I, th- I wouldn't know that. And then, and therefore the circle around me who I talk to constantly about what I do for work also wouldn't know. Um, yeah. So uh, I don't know. I don't know how that gets fixed. Unless there you go. Why is Kim like a, spreading the word for you? <laughs> I am. I am. I'm more aware. The more you open your mind to things, you know, maybe ignorance isn't bliss, you know? Um, so let's move on to the September issue. Um, so who wrote the uh, cover feature? I did. You wrote the I cover think. feature, Lois? It was for September, yes. It, it was for September, Lois. <laughs> I think yeah. I did. But I, I think, did. where in, in are we words, in the year? In the words of JB, I don't remember anything about it. No, I, mm. I do. Um, so I wrote the cover. Well, I've just finished working on the cover feature for September. Um, and it's all about the changes that the um, FCA made to its AR regime. So that's appointed representatives regime for networks or any businesses that have appointed representatives, actually. Um, and so I was just sort of looking into what the changes were, how they affected or how they are affecting networks, because we're just coming up to a year since the changes came into force. Mm -hmm. And so networks are now having to, um, they're having to like do a deep dive on all their appointed representatives every year and produce a report for the FCA into every single one. So obviously with networks that have like 100, 150, 200 ARs, that's quite a big undertaking so every year they i think it's i think it's november or december they have to submit their sort of annual report on their ars to the fca and they're just having to look into every single ar a lot more in depth than they were before so i spoke to a few different networks some of them or one of them was saying that they've noticed a massive like burden has been put on them having to look into every single one because they said, well, we wouldn't onboard a bad AR. So we kind of, and, and we've we've known quite a lot of them for, you know, decades. So we trust them and it's a lot of work having to look in depth at every single one. But then others, other networks that I spoke to say, well, we haven't really noticed much of a difference because we were looking into all our ARs anyway when they onboarded. So I don't know. Anyway, I've gone into quite a lot of detail there and I don't want to, Ruin too much away. Month, all. Although, <laughs> say, saying that, um, just to sort of go back to news slightly, just as we were going to print, an interesting story came out, Lois, which I think you oh, covered. Oh, yes. Yes, thank you for bringing that up. So it was on um, Tenet. Is mm-hmm. you know, Tenet, the network, um, can't remember how many ARs it's got, but it's offloading them all onto Open Work and Primus. Okay. So Primus is a um, mortgage network. Mm-hmm. And open work is obviously advice network. Yeah. And so, yeah, it looks like Tenet's just wanting to get rid of all its ARs and focus on its own advice business and its like compliance services business and stuff, which is interesting because I would have thought its network was, was its biggest part. Component. But mm-hmm. anyway, um, so I haven't found out much more yet. But yes, it was good timing. Shows were on the on the pulse. <laughs> And we'll see what comes of it in the future, I guess. Yeah, and we'll see, like, after the first annual reports come out, we'll get to see even more how much of a burden it has been or whether it's actually a good thing. Okay. And how many ARs potentially leave as a result and see what other networks do, whether they they jump ship or whether they sort of capitalise on it. We'll mm. see. We'll see. Future gazing. Um, and Darius, what about you? What have you got coming up in September? Um, for, well, for September, Meg, I um, I wrote the uh, MM Meets. Um, uh-huh. So I, I met. Uh, was that your first Trump. MM Meets? That was my first ever MM Meets. Yes. Yay. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. Um, so no, that was a um, a fun experience, definitely. Um, it was very interesting. Yeah. So I met uh, Andy Caranva, chief executive of Standard Life. And mm-hmm. I obviously I spoke to him, um, and, and and you know yeah it was uh, it was interesting. And we're meeting and uh, learn, you know get to uh, know him a bit more than just your typical interview you usually have. Um, but yeah, he, he sort of spoke about how um, <clears throat> uh, following graduation he um, 
moved from Scotland to Reading uh, and he worked for Prudential and um, after his sort of graduate rotation he ended up working with Prudential Holborn Division which was basically like their advisor division and that's when he sort of uh, so reasonably early on in his career he got to sort of know the financial um, advisor aspect of everything and uh, you know you saw how first time like how important it is and how it can be used and he, he was saying that he wants sort of um, he fought 20 or 30 years you're saying life had a really good reputation with advisors and he wants to get that back really he wants to sort of you know focus on that and um, uh, bring that back to fruition sort of presently so he, yeah that was one sort of a focus of his to make it a bit more um, sort of an advisor focus as it were so yeah mm-hmm. um, but you know I, I've um, yeah, no, it was, it was it was nice that she's sort of have a more of an in length interview uh, with someone yeah. and you know get to know you know more about them just so just the um, yeah the business side of things as it were. Yeah, I think you get to meet a lot of interesting characters that way, and I make them interesting characters, but interesting people, um, and get to hear their story and how they got to where they are, and that's always interesting to read um, as well. Um, mm. And Katie, what about you? What have you got coming up in September? Well, I almost forgot to write the editor's view for the magazine, Kim, uh, because I've been so out of practice. And I (laughs) I wrote a leader for the magazine. So, you know, I hadn't done one of those. I don't think I'd actually had one included in the mag previously. So I I wrote this leader ahead of time and got that sent over. And that was about um, interest in cash savings. Um, platforms it's not a place for people to hold vast sums of money in cash that's not Mm -hmm. what they're designed for um but obviously inevitably some people do have some money in that way maybe with the way of how the market's going at the moment we spoke earlier about people sort of withdrawing money or might be doing things they might feel that cash is more of a safer haven than other um assets and things like that at the moment but it's something that the FCA has been looking at um, time and time again of, you know, are you then passing on that interest fairly to customers or are you sort of keeping that within your business? Uh, so I had a little bit of fun and sort of wrote a dear CEO letter to the platform bosses and, <laughs> uh, you know, at the end then just sort of implied, well, you know, you don't have to take this one as seriously from me, um, but the FCA might be looking at this a little bit more closely mm-hmm. um i was going to have fun with the headline and says that the fca takes interest in cash savings so then i thought i could get into <laughs> trouble so i said shows interest in uh, rather than it looking like they're actually taking the money themselves yeah. as well um so that's what i did and then obviously suddenly remembered yes i do need to actually write an intro to the mag um so the obviously it was lois's cover feature and that got me thinking about my first job and returning to work and things like that and um, mm-hmm. Because the tenant story dropped right then, I was able to make a reference to it then as well. Um, yeah. But just while um, Darius mentioned Standard Life, uh, did prompt another sort of story that I did right at the end of August about the company potentially looking to introduce a platform like experience for okay. advisors. So they were sort of at pains to not refer to it exactly as a platform, um, but would have some of the functionality that advisors know of platforms anyway. There's quite an interesting backstory with how Phoenix Group acquired Standard Life, the insurance Mm -hmm. arm. Uh, So Standard Life is now part of that. It used to be sort of Standard Life Aberdeen, and then that's rebranded to Aberdeen. But there was a whole sort of complicated thing of one of the companies owning part of this insurance bit, and then the other one still owning the brand. And it obviously got very complicated for customers. So there's been a bit of a Mm -hmm. more of a clearer distinction I think both the companies are probably still in the, those final throes of getting it all sorted and, and done. Um, but that's obviously I pr- probably left Standard Life without a kind of platform. Um, and, yeah, so I've got information about that, that they're looking to sort of do that. And also um, had a story about its parent company, Phoenix Group, looking to recruit for a, a small number of roles, admittedly, that could be potentially at risk of redundancy um, down the line. Yes. So it's just unfortunate for them that while I was sort of trying to find out information about this platform and who they might be recruiting for, I just happened to look through a few more job applications and um, 
advertisement, sorry, um, and and saw then that yeah they're looking to they they to be fair to them they put a clear note on it to say that this could be at risk of redundancy and it's not definitely, um, but that with their whole reassure business and things like that that that, that could be an interesting one um, as well. So I think those two came right at the end of August. So I think I can slip them in now as well. Yeah, no, they're definitely interesting stories, and I think for people who might have been looking at those jobs, they might be like, oh, maybe I missed that section. And you gave them a heads up. Yeah. Um, and finally, Mike, what have you got coming up in September? Where will you be in September? Where will I, where will I be? Well, uh, obviously, uh, well, I've got a leader coming up mm -hmm. in, uh, in uh, September, which is about the uh, mansion house reforms. Um, which were announced uh, by Jeremy Hunt as part of his Mansion House speech. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just making light of uh, those, uh, a lot of those big, big reforms um, and what they might mean for the advice market, um, what they might mean for people with pensions and what they might mean for, I guess, also um, in my old world, uh, pension scheme uh, trustees as well, because quite a few of the um, reforms were we're touching on that. I think the big themes uh, in those reforms, sort of headline themes, were sort of uh, consolidation, mm -hmm. um, make it, you know, consolidating the uh, the market um, a lot more, uh, and also uh, by the back door, trying to kind of make pensions the sort of uh, magic money tree for the government. So I think those are the two 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 things, which is quite interesting. Yeah. Um, so that's what I wrote. And then in terms of personal news, um, yeah. uh, uh, which everyone on this podcast already knows, but maybe the, the wider world doesn't, um, uh, uh, this will be my last podcast. Um, Boo. Boo. Yeah, I was going to do as well. <laughs> I, also just I, I just love the way <laughs> that you asked that question. You had a real edge to it at the beginning. Like, I really noticed that, Kim. It was like, so there where will no you edge. be? Where will I'm, you my, be? In my, tone, my tone was literally light and happy. Yeah. Happy no, no, for I'm you. Happy. No, thank you. Um, no, 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 just, just, just kidding. Um, no, so uh, I will be. Um, I'm, I'm leading money marketing after nearly uh, six years. Um, Honestly, that's a lot of commitment. I appreciate. Which is you. So, so, thank you. So I've, so I've been at money, money, money marketing since December 2017. December 2017, um, and uh, I will. Um, so I'll be leaving in mid September. So yeah, completely so, different, looking at different stuff. Completely different. So so I'm going to be uh, having to probably build myself up up quite a bit, uh, quite a bit again with loads of meetings and uh, um, learning about new topics. But a whole um, new exciting chapter. Yeah, whole new exciting chapter. So so um, so yeah, I'm sad to say say goodbye, uh, but also excited about um, the next step. Um, uh, I, I guess my life really at Money Marketing has been about pensions mm -hmm. um, and kind of mid-September when I leave will also sort of also mark another anniversary because I became a pensions journalist in mid in, in kind of mid-September 2014. So it have been nine years writing about oh. about pensions, either for trustees in my first life, professional pensions or or advisors. So, yeah. so yeah. Um, and so it's like you're growing up. Yeah, growing up. You're evolving. Yeah, no, evolving. Yeah, yeah. So, so, um, yeah, I've learned a tremendous amount and, um, you know, thank everyone here. Um, you know, really good team. But, but yeah, it's, um, you know, life happens, things change. Um, and I think I'm ready for a change. Um, if, if I was yeah. to do like a little, uh, a crazy of, of like to, to put labels on it, I'd say my first couple of years as like the pensions, you know, senior pensions reporter i was writing a lot about db transfers mm -hmm. and the british steel pension scheme scandal mm -hmm. um and how a, a, a lot, lot of steel workers were, were screwed there um and the changes there um and then my sort of second phase i guess i was sort of writing about a lot of the uh about sips self-invested personal pensions um and sort mm -hmm. of these big sip court cases mm -hmm. um there um um and then sort of I guess the sort of final stage was sort of being coming I mean, like news editor and then like acting for a bit was learning about sort of management and how to run things and and processes um and 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 stuff. 
um so which is um completely completely different but um invaluable so so yeah a lot in those um nearly six years yeah well, we're, we're all very excited for you mike with what the future holds but also obviously very sad to Thank see you. you leave our team um will you still be listening to the podcast because obviously we discuss very important things like aliens yes. so i think aliens. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah yeah it's vital that you keep listening um and also you know we might still let you come to the mm awards if you'd like to i know you Thank leave you. in yes. september but, I think, um, I think, so a lot I of think, plus yeah, i think i would like awards. to i think yeah. i think i would i would like to so well, that sort of thing so 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 big changes both personal and professional we're exciting. all happening within exciting yeah but but also a bit sort of like oh you know um <laughs> well, that's life like, that's life yeah so mm. so it's a sort of a bit anxious but also like you know positive excitement about about like the changes and, and things um and i think the other thing we have to mention as well is that we have to say darius you know <laughs> passed the past his probation with flying colors and um yay darius and, you're and sticking so, with us so yeah. yeah so so that's the other thing so so yeah, and got the first and then meets in, uh, which yeah. is really good and uh, read very well. Um, and you also got some good, good uh, praise, didn't you, on your Bassett and Gold um, coverage, which is as uh, well from, a, from an investor, was it, uh, or an Axe investor? Uh, weekend essay about um, what happened, what occurred. Yeah, it was just a nice feeling that um, to see my journalism actually. Um, um, actually helps actually benefit someone and um, uh, get the money back the road and you know um, person was in need of it due to uh, circumstances so yeah that was it was yeah it was a, it was a really nice feeling to, to actually see that to see, uh, to see my writer actually help someone so yeah, that was yeah. a that was a lovely feeling yeah, yeah. and with was less beautiful. than six months in the role by that stage Darius so very yeah good. That's very yeah good. no yeah excellent yeah. Mike you've started now you have to congratulate each of us for something uh, why are you doing this? <laughs> um, I'm not gonna. I'm gonna control this and say you don't have to do that, Mike. You can do that off the mic. Um, <laughs> I'm going to wrap up this end of month podcast by saying, like Katie mentioned, we do have the Money Marketing Awards that are coming up on the 21st of September. Um, so if you haven't got your seat, you haven't got your table, what are you doing? This is going to be the best event in financial advice this year. Yeah, I it's said it. Ever. And the red yeah. carpet treatment, like red Central carpet, London, we're Square. at the Londoner, we're busting everything. So everything you can possibly imagine and everything you can't imagine is going to happen there. So um, you should definitely be there. And also look out for our conference, uh, Money Marketing Interactive London, which will be in October. Um, so if you haven't signed up for that either, make sure to head to the website and get your delegate ticket. So, yeah. Um, and also subscribe to the magazine and follow us on all our social medias. Um, but again, thank you guys so much for joining me for this end of month podcast and sayonara, Mike. <laughs> sayonara. <laughs> this is the last one. Sayonara, I'm trying to think thanks. of a different way to say bye, but yeah. Thank au revoir, for... au revoir. That, I mean, that, yeah. sounds, that sounds well, much nicer than sayonara. Well, like, sayonara <laughs> like... is like a final, I don't know, in my mind. But yeah, thank you, Mike, for everything you've done. And uh, yeah. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.